we'll, we'll do our best. As a reminder, this meeting is being recorded um, so that we as staff have the recordings after um, this um, and that we will be um, as shared in past meetings, looking to post them online and make them more accessible for everybody after the fact. We also have um, Heather and Sarah here, our ASL interpreters for the night. Um, so big um, welcome to them. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'll, we are in our third session together. So a lot of this will be um, reminders to y'all. So I won't spend too much time on this part, but just remember our, our set of norms and for our, our time and space together. Um, they are the same as the other two sessions. Um, and we are in this together like we shared last time, right? Today, we're, we're really gonna kick off. We're gonna do some recap of the last session. Um, we're going to hear from a number of organizations that are supporting playful learning in the district so that we can hear about some of those rock stars that are doing those bright spots that we've been talking about. We're then gonna do an activity looking about who are the stakeholders we need to convince um, to bring forward our vision together. We're gonna take a break. Then we're gonna do a breakout, breakout discussion again. And I heard last week that everybody really loved the breakouts. That was one piece of feedback that we received from a lot of people. And so you will have ample time again, I promise, because today we are going to be brainstorming strategies and tactics um, for, for, um, to promote playful learning. And then we'll talk about some next steps because it is the last of our three sessions together. What? All right, so just a reminder that our planning team was a number of different organizations, but really the idea for all of this came from, from parents and families. Um, and so thank you to all of our rock star planning team members who helped us uh, bring this to light. We all know the goals. We're here um, to build that collective vision for playful learning in the district. We are centering youth and family voice. We are amplifying those community bright spots and what's working in the district. And we are all gonna work together to educate, advocate and coordinate for change um, because it takes that village and we are that village for our kids, right? As a reminder, there's three ways we're collecting feedback for that. And this session is only one of three. Um, so we, this summer, we're our, our team and the planning team and any of you who wanna get involved, um, we will be doing a survey that's live now and we will be hosting these one-on-one -on -one kitchen table conversations where we go out to youth and families and really get them to directly give us feedback into what they wanna see when it comes to playful learning. So if you have ideas, please send them our way because we will go and talk to anybody who will have us. As I said, this is the last of our three sessions. This summer we'll be doing the survey and the kitchen table conversations. And their hope is, is that we'll have something ready to launch to the community to kickstart this work um, and those tactics and strategies we talk about tonight in September. So our goals for today are really to develop those benchmark goals of things we wanna see in the short term and long term when it comes to playful learning and really develop those tactics and activities we want, to, we want to do together to meet that collective vision, right? So that we can be coordinated in our effort. So to recap, last time we, we did an exercise where we talked about why every child should have access to playful learning. And these are the themes that we, we pulled from all of the feedback that we received from y'all. So, it's key to relationship building, skills building, learning, building identity of our kids, right? Um, promoting equity, right? That play is, play is a basic human right, that kids deserve this opportunity. And that it's really critical to the men mental and emotional health of our students, right? We're coming out of a global pandemic. We find concurrent pandemics happening for our students racism, violence, whether it's police brutality, whether it's COVID-19, our kids are going through a lot and they've been through a lot over the last year and a half. And so play is one of those ways that 
we can all rally behind our kids to provide them with that support that they need right now to, to build healthy relationships, to address the trauma that has happened over the last year and move forward. We also said, we also asked like, what should playful learning look like? And this is what you all said. You said it should be fun and engaging. There was a lot of, of um, comments of just saying fun over and over and over again, because learning should be fun, right? The environments for our kids should be fun. Um, they should be inclusive. So a lot of comments here about it not being threatening, not being pun punitive, making sure that whatever gets put forward is culturally responsive, relevant, right? That it looks, that is integral to the school day. So it's just part of the way of how, how teaching and learning is done in the district. It should foster skill building again. It should have variety, so structured, unstructured opportunities. Um, it should be student driven, right? So students should have a say in what this looks like um, and should be able to have those moments to define what they wanna do to support their own playful learning. And it should be intergenerational. So thinking about some of those opportunities for both teachers, parents, and students, for teachers, parents, and students to learn together. So very interesting stuff that came out of it, but a lot of, a lot of similarities between those two questions, right? You know, and I think it really comes down to how are we center, centering kids' experience, right? Authentic kids, allowing them to be themselves, to have those opportunities to explore and, and to figure out what their learning experience should be like for them, right? We also spent some time um, analyzing what was going on. So we did the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats um, discussion together. Um, and we're currently analyzing those results um, that will be reflected in the final vision together. So there's still time if you weren't able to attend that, that last meeting. If you have ideas on that, um, we have a Google form that we'll share out. Um, in the summary email at the end of the session. So you can share your feedback that way. So that was basically, you know, where we've been. And so before we kick off our organizations today, I wanted to say that Alicia Evans was going to share all of this with you, but unfortunately she's caught that awful cold that is going around. Our team has been dropping like flies. <laughs> I'm getting over it. Eric Stevens on our team is getting over it. And unfortunately, Alicia got it. And she was so bummed she couldn't be here with all of you. But I wanted to start by, before we kick off what organizations are doing, is to talk a little bit about what Healthy Kids staff have been doing in schools. So we currently have funding through the Greater Rochester Health Foundation and through New York State Department of Health to really advance policies, systems, environmental changes that support whole child health in schools and in neighborhoods, really. Our work in schools when it comes to play is really focused in on a lot of our work. So we bring and convene folks together. We really look to center family voice, which is why it's been so important to us that so many families were and students were involved in not only these convenings, but as we continue to collect feedback for this vision. We um, have been advocating for over a decade for district-wide policy changes that support play. So whether that is um, supporting a daily active recess policy, advocating that um, for a policy that says recess should not be taken away as, as a form of punishment, all of those things are work that Healthy Kids staff have supported parents um, to push forward. We also work directly in 15 school buildings and elementary school buildings in the district, providing technical assistance, resource support. So Alicia spends a lot of her time thinking about things like how do we build playful learning environments in some of our buildings, whether that's walking trails, providing giant games like Connect Four that can be housed in the library, supporting play during family engagement nights and, and, and really provides that assistance to, um, to the buildings to say, this is how you can do some of those things. We also work very closely with Playworks and others to provide professional development when it comes to play. So whether that is bringing in folks like Playworks to do that work or working with folks to bring in yoga, yoga for kids, right? 
providing those opportunities for staff to be involved and not just teachers or not just um, phys the phys ed teachers, but really thinking about the school as that community, right? So bringing in parents, bringing in the community organizations that work so that they can also learn these techniques that Playworks has or others have to support that language around building that playful and healthy environment for kids. We do a lot with statewide advocacy, so stay tuned for that because I'm so excited to hear what you all think of tonight. Um, but we've done a lot with New York State Ed and pushing forward um, and advocating for the next generation standards and continuing to really stress the importance for play as New York State Ed has been developing their reopening plans for um, school districts. And again, families, 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 right? Um, Beatrice um, and I and our whole team of 10 are really here to support all of you and the families and students of the district. So we spend a lot of time listening and, and hearing what y'all wanna do, and then we work with you to do it. Um, and so whether that's bringing resources to you directly to be able to implement, whether that is sharing how, how to go to school board or go to your principal to make that change happen, we are here for you as that resource. So I share all that to say that while we do a lot, we can't do it alone, right? And so I'm gonna turn it over to Beatrice um, cause she's gonna kick off um, and introduce our facilitator for the night to talk about, um, to, to kick off our organizational panel. Thank you, Jen. Um, so tonight, Carla Stell Hoffman, and I hope I said that right, Carla, because I realized afterwards I should have asked you how to properly pronounce your last name, um, is going to be facilitating the community-based organizations. And she's also here representing her community-based organization, which is Grasa under the Community Foundation. And I'll let her share more about her organization and the work that they do to center play. Um, so with that, Carla, I'm actually going to turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, everybody. So glad to see so many familiar faces and so many names I recognize on the screen. It all works. We're just glad you're here. Um, I am Carla Stow Huffman. Beatrice, you've got it perfect. Thank you so much. I know that O-U-G-H throws people. There's a lot of ways to say that, but my family pronounces it Stow, so thank you. Um, and I am with Grasa, the Greater Rochester After School and Summer Alliance. For those of you who know Grasa, we are an intermediary for all things out of school time in the region. So that is before school, after school, but it's also evening programming, weekend programming, summer programming. It's basically anything that kids are doing to learn outside of a traditional classroom during traditional class hours. And our role as an intermediary is really to help bring resources to the community, to do advocacy on behalf of all of our agencies who are out there on the front lines providing this great programming, um, to bring new and innovative programs that we hear about through our national connections into our community. Pretty much anything that supports anyone doing out of school work with young people, we are down to be your backbone. Like we are here to help you be the best program possible and help you have fun doing it. So I'm gonna real quickly just give you Gross's aspect on play and then I'm gonna introduce you to our other panel members and let them do most of the talking. But I just have to put a plug in here. Um, if you know me, I've been working with kids in this community for maybe 30 years this fall and play is just essential to how the work is done, right? Play is my go-to as a human being for learning. Um, and that hasn't stopped since I graduated from college and it didn't start when I walked into kindergarten, right? I was playing as a child and learning things before I ever got to school. And it's kind of strange to have to admit this, but even though I was in school much longer ago than many of you, and I was in a rural community when we usually think rural communities don't have a lot of resources, we played a lot when we were learning. We had weekly spelling bees that were like games of tag, right? We had um, pop quizzes that were done in relay races. There was a lot of play in learning in my own life when I was young and I don't see it now. And it 
not only scares me, but it makes me quite sad. Um, we always think things get better over time, but sometimes we lose a step as well. And play is one of those things we can't afford to lose a step on. So Grasa tries in all the ways that we interact with agencies and entities to always kind of push playful learning to the front, right? So when we work with schools, when we do professional development, we try to model, um, most of my workshops have interactive games and activities, like that's, that's to me, that, that's, that's fun learning. And so we try to model that when we go out, but we also advocate all the time for all of the agencies who are doing this work on the front line um, to make people understand how big and how important play is, right? And it came out last week in our conversation. Play isn't just recess and phys ed. Playful learning can happen in a multitude of ways and it can be integrated so seamlessly that kids don't even know which is which, right? And that's that's like my ultimate vision. So I'm very happy to be here tonight and I'm gonna kick off by asking Andrew to introduce themselves and tell you about some of the wonderful things he is doing with Playworks. Andrew? Hello, uh, my name is Andrew Siebel Jansen. I am the Associate Program Director for Playworks. Uh, we are a national nonprofit based out of Oakland, California, but our most impactful and beneficial and relevant work is, of course, the work we do here in Rochester. Uh, my role specifically is more so on the uh, managing side directly, but what we really do as an organization is we really incentivize and prioritize the use of play directly through providing, whether it's professional developments to staff, teachers, community partners, or parents. We also provide staffing to certain RCSD schools. We're in, currently in 15 RCSD schools right now. And then we also have training opportunities extended for RCSD staff throughout the district. And then we also have relationships with a lot of other community youth orgs. So we have a lot of um, cross play, we'd like to say with a lot of our organizational partners. As far as just our really purpose of what we do, we're really there to make sure that that whole play advocacy gets pushed forward by really giving people the tools and skills to do so. I think that so often a lot of times, even when we're having these conversations about play, a lot of times what kind of falls off, I think we can all agree that play is important, but actually giving people the tools and skill sets to do so and to learn how and to provide that material in a fun, inventive, exciting, innovative way is really the best way we found that people can connect to the work. We found that students of all ages uh, really gravitate towards this kind of material, which is not surprising, but it's really always fun for us when we get to do these kinds of things with other adults. And you really see that, you know, we have opportunities where we get to work with maybe like a corporate company and we do a little, we call the corporate recess. Where we jump in and like run essentially like a play-based or recess-based activity. And you really just see how much fun adults have. And I think a lot of times we tell, we as like adults move away from that world of play. And when we have opportunities to do so, you remind, you're just reminded of how much fun that really is. And I think just for me, as far as what the work should look like and what it means to me in the future, just it's really about being deliberate in what we do and how we get this information out there. That's really always my thing that we wanna make sure that we don't just say play more. Well, you can play more by doing this. You can play this game. I'm gonna show you these tools and these skills that you can take this to your home, your church, your community, your school, and really to make sure that everyone has those tools to best utilize them in whatever way or fashion fits their environment. We know that not every home is the same, not every family is the same, not every community is the same, but at least that if we provide some sort of frameworks for play, that those can be translated into whatever environment works best. Thank you, Andrew. That's awesome. And now, um, Ani, are you gonna speak for Generation Two? Yes. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Ani Hurd, and I'm the Community Outreach Director with Generation Two. And so over the past 17 years, Generation Two has really focused on pairing children in kindergarten to second grade with trustworthy volunteers for weekly one-on-one -on -one play sessions. And we've been doing so through a school-based program. 
So we advocate for play as a universal language that allows children to learn, grow, and continue to explore the world around them. So as some of you may know, child-directed play allows a child to make the rules, change the rules, and lead during a play session. That is the basis for our play sessions that we use when we interact with volunteers and the K through two students. So through our programs, children have the opportunity to experience the social and emotional benefits of child-directed play while making meaningful connections with adults in their lives. All right, thank you. And next, Deb McCoy, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, hi everybody, thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. I'm Debbie McCoy from the Strong National Museum of Play. I oversee the education programs there. So I'm all about play. We are all about play. I think I have the best job in the world. Um, I'm a teacher by training and was a very playful teacher. And now I get to help other folks um, learn about play. Our mission succinctly as an institution is to promote and study the role of play, not just in human development, but in how it informs cultural history. But we look at play, when we talk about play, we're thinking very broadly. So I know a lot of times, especially when you talk about play in school, people jump to free play or think it really only applies to preschool or, you know, and that's what they have in mind or recess, but, and they see a very clear separation between now it's playtime and now it's learning time. So in keeping with what a lot of you have already said, we're very interested in looking broadly at play and helping support people as they blur those lines <laughs> uh, between, you know, now we're playing, now we're learning. And we think about um, playful learning in terms of playful inquiry, project-based learning, playful math, playful literacy. So, and that's not just at the early childhood level, although it may come more intuitively to those folks um, because of their backgrounds. But we've supported work. I've recent, I've worked with the state ed department, thinking about those next generation standards with instructional specialists from state ed and BOCES on how to support teachers in implementing those in playful ways. Um, worked with professors at play, university professors interested in bringing more play to college instruction. Um, so, and of course, lots of work with early childhood folks. So I'm really excited to hear and learn from all of you and hopefully make some important connections. Thank you, Debbie. And now last, but certainly not least, Rebecca. Good evening, everybody. My name is Rebecca Boyle. I am director of pre-K for the Rochester City School District. I'm um, a pleasure to be here this evening um, because as um, Deb just referenced about the importance of play, especially in the preschool area, um, but we're really hoping within the Rochester City School District that our philosophy of children learning through play is going to continue to advance through the early grades. So it's not just focused on pre-K. And we've already been doing some work um, with our director of ELA and our director of math um, to support that as we're moving um, students from kindergarten um, and into first grade. So for us, um, play really is how children learn. And um, the longest part of our um, daily schedule or our day in preschool um, is what we call our work time. Um, and so for our littlest learners, our work time is play-based. Um, but on our daily schedule, it says work time because while they're doing that, that's when they are learning because they are actively engaged um, and they're actively engaged too with their teacher. Because um, I think again, what Deb said was so important is that it's not just always open play. Um, there needs to be some intentional planning from the teacher behind the scenes. Um, and the teacher needs to be actively involved playing right along with the children 
so that they are working on building vocabulary and they are scaffolding the children's knowledge, getting them to take risks or try things that maybe they wouldn't normally be um, having an interest in. But when they get that opportunity and they get that um, exposure to it, it really broadens their um, horizons. So again, the biggest part of our day in pre-K is considered work time and our gross motor time. So we have two opportunities for students in the school day for work time, so it's an hour each, and then their gross motor time for their physical outdoor play or in the gym is 45 minutes of the schedule. And the other thing that I really wanna emphasize when we are talking about play is truly giving children a choice. So during our work time, we have what we call our plan do review cycle, where the teacher actually talks with the kids about coming up with a plan about what is it that you would like to be working on today. Um, and some kids are going to choose that they want to go over to the house area and that they are going to be making um, a family dinner. Other students may say that they are going to be heading over to the block area and they are going to be building a zoo. And then they're going to go over to the toy area and grab some of the animals that are over there um, to be able to, you know, bring that over to the block area for the zoo that they've made. We've got sand table and water table in the room also, because there's so much that students can learn, um, especially with having that sensory tactile experience. Um, and in addition to those, we have, you know, a science center um, in all of our rooms. We have a music interest area in all of our rooms. So our pre-K classrooms are set up based on interest areas and learning centers. Students get that opportunity to plan, so they're choosing themselves what they would like to do. Then they have that opportunity to play um, in the non-COVID world, to play with each other. Um, this past year with COVID, um, unfortunately, it was playing in their pods um, where we actually recreated each learning center for each child individually in their area. And um, we have some phenomenal pictures of the resiliency of kids and how important play is to them and wanting to play with one another, that their pods are taped off in colored tape so they know that they are supposed to stay in their area. Um, but it was so fun to see the kids with their dinosaurs and the dinosaurs going across that tape line into somebody else's area so that they could play together. Um, and even to have seen the kids during COVID playing with their friends at home because we sent home blocks to every family to have at home since we weren't able to have all of our students back at school. And seeing the kids at home playing with their blocks building and then the students in class having their iPads out to be able to play with their friends at home and also building blocks. So the children were really um, creative with coming up with how they could continue to still play with their friends. Um, and the teachers and the work that they did behind the scenes to make all of that possible for the kids. So once the students in our plan do review time, then that opportunity at their end of their work time or play time, the teacher has conversations with each child about what they did during that time so that the children have the opportunity to, again, work on their vocabulary, to work on processing and sequencing of what did you do first? then what did you do? Who were you playing with? So that opportunity to also build that oral language is so important for our students. And so play, again, allows all of that um, to be happening. And even during what we consider our small group time, um, when students are in a more um, direct instruction with the teacher, we still allow for um, every student to have their own materials so they are actively engaged. So it's not just the teacher talking to their small group of kids. Each child has their own materials and it's open-ended enough where they can follow the teacher's lead or they will do their own thing that they may want to do um, with their materials that they have. And then it's the teacher's responsibility to meet the children where they are at and to scaffold and help them to move along um, in their learning. So everything for us in preschool is about child development and meeting the kids where they are, that play-based learning, student choice, um, and having those interest areas in those learning centers um, in the classroom. So 
all of our students can be actively engaged. Thank you, Rebecca. Okay, so the way we have this set up, we have a couple of questions that um, we've been presented that I'm gonna ask all the panelists and you can jump in and answer. Um, just raise your hand, I'll call on you, but there are only four of us. They're short questions. Uh, and then when we get done with those, um, we're gonna check the chat to see what questions come up for the group, and we're gonna leave time at the end to answer those questions. So does that sound like a plan? All right, so Rebecca, you're a perfect lead in for the first question, because the question is, what are you currently doing in the district to advance play? And we have you to thank for the, the district actually having a good foundation, like you're one of those bright spots. So thank you for sharing that. I'm gonna ask the other three panelists, if you could tell us right now, what you are currently doing directly with the district to advance play. Andrew. Start us off. Uh, so kind of like I briefly mentioned before, Playworks is working directly with the Rochester City School District in two capacities. We provide training to any and all RCSD staff. We did a series of trainings in the spring where any RCSD staff could uh, join the trainings and learn kind of about the play-based approach, play-based material. And this, this is for all grade levels from pre-K through 12. Um, and the teachers were also able to get professional development credit for being there, which was absolutely amazing. So uh, shout out to Carlos Cotto and his team for really helping us make that happen. Also have direct staffing in the RCSD. So we have three amazing staff members, our three site coordinators, one of them is on this call right now, hey Dex, who join us on join us in doing work directly with the RCSD. What that looks like is in our in-person world, back when that was a thing, uh, that would mean that we would have staff going to schools uh, maybe a couple times a week and literally spending their entire day like going through their recess procedures, their whatever play-based material they're using in schools and really being very intentional about providing new material, providing feedback, providing information, providing supports and structures. We really fly by that I do, you do, we, you, we do model, which is where we want to provide the, stru the structure and the basis. We let the teachers, staff, admin kind of utilize that to whatever degree they so choose. And then we kind of come back and really review what went well, what didn't work, what could we use more, what could we use less of. In addition to that, we also had staffing where uh, we would have our team come in directly just to run recesses come in, run your outdoor recesses, run indoor recesses. If you have open gym spaces, they can utilize that into spaces. We've had our staff be so creative with the spaces that they've been able to utilize and transform in school buildings. So you'd be amazed at the amount of resources, recesses we've been able to have in classrooms and gymnasiums, but also in hallways, in staircases, in these traditionally spaces you don't really think of as play spaces, but that's really what our focus is is to really highlight that play can happen anywhere. In our virtual environment, of course, that we're still living through now, we really put a focus on putting out resources that are available to use and are accessible anywhere. So that means that we provide games that can be played with virtual students at home that don't require materials, it doesn't require setup, it doesn't require additional spaces, and it really provides a creative way to really bridge that distance gap that a lot of the students are feeling. You don't necessarily get the same experience, obviously when you're so far away and on screens, but it's really a level and a way to interact with your peers that the Zoom environment really doesn't always give you. So again, for us, it's really just about being intentional, deliberate and creative, but also giving people the space to figure out what works best for them. Debbie? Well, um, because our education team is currently very lean and does not include any of our teaching hosts this year, um, given that we're not offering school programs, um, we are in a planning phase in terms of our continuing our work with RCSD. Right before COVID, we had run a pilot called Let's Play with um, all of the kindergarten classes in three 
RCSD schools and it involved free visits to the museum. And prior to that, having some work together with me, workshops on playful learning and how to set those museum visits into the context of what made sense with each class curriculum. So that was very successful. And we were in the discussion stage, literally the day before our shutdown um, on how to bring that to all of the kindergarten classes of RCSD. We really would love to focus on kindergarten. Since then, we have had discussions. Our president and CEO met with Dr. Meyer Small, with other leaders of cultural institutions, with the goal of looking at how RCSD classes, whole classes might each have a consistent experience. My motive is to get all the kindergarten classes to come to the Strong Museum at least twice throughout the school year. But um, so more to come about that. But again, we are really interested in doing that and in partnering. We have had some, we had a very small um, camp for children with to support virtual learning back in the fall and that those were primarily RCSD students and we partnered with Ani and Ashley and Generation 2 for a very small part in their wonderful program that I'll let you um, Ani tell you more about. Hello, Go for it Ani. So currently, um, we're working with School 45 and Rise Community School within RCSD. And prior to COVID, our volunteers were trained in child directed play, and they met weekly for one on one play sessions for about three minutes with children at these schools. We were at both of these sites working with kindergarten to first graders and serving over 200 children. However, in response to COVID and not being able to provide in person sessions, we launched the Please Play campaign in order to bring children from R in their homes. And so we collaborated with RISE and School 45 to be able to provide play kits for the children who were participating in G2 at these schools. And so these play kits included Play-Doh, Doodle Pad, and animal figurines, art, and some other resources. And so we continue to distribute our educational content, whether it be our play kits or our other content, such as videos and infographics, um, in order to be able to provide workshops for parents, schools, and other community organizations on child-directed play that serve RCSD students. And so School 45 and RISE are very eager to have us back in the fall, whether it be in-person, hybrid, or strictly virtual. And also, we recently completed um, a virtual pilot program with the Rock City Learning Pod. And for those of you who don't know what that program is, it's a program run through local libraries that provides a space for RCSD students can receive assistance with schoolwork during the remote and hybrid options. And so during this time period, we connected children with volunteers from local colleges, so such as St. John Fisher and Nazareth. And in order to engage in these one-on-one -on -one play sessions from about February to the end of May. And we also provide play kits in this time for the volunteers and for the children as well to ensure that the children participating 
um, in the program have access to developmentally appropriate toys. Um, and also, as Debbie mentioned, we did partner with the Strong Museum of Play um, to offer a G-Tube Day of Play uh, for families who participated in the Rock City Learning Pods, um, as well as families who participated in our parent workshop through the world in RCSC. Um, anything that you were not able to Okay, and I'm sorry we had to lose your face, Ani, but it definitely helped the audio when you turned your video off. So thank you for that. And we we, re, we will keep the, the vision in our heads of how lovely you look on the other side of that screen. So we got you. All right, crew, um, leaving time for questions in the box. We have about six to 10 minutes and we have two questions left. So I'm gonna combine them and I'm gonna ask you all to try to be as articulate as possible in about two and a half minutes each. And these are the fun questions, so you can do this. The two questions are, what's your vision for this work in the future? And how are you going to partner for change? And I think they go together, because if you have a vision, you better have a plan for how you're gonna make it happen. So who wants to dive in first? Debbie, go for it. Okay, I sort of tipped my hand about the vision, but I should say that um, in addition to that idea of bringing the Let's Play program to more students in, in kindergarten, um, I think also there are a lot of opportunities for students in other grades. So I wouldn't want to limit it to that. We'd love to talk about um, how we can be responsive to after school programs, how we can, we also are renovating and opening a brand new Woodbury school set of classrooms that we have committed to use for a summer program. And that is going to be for underserved students, probably in the Rochester City School District. So we definitely are looking for partners for that work. We're, you know, it's, it's not our area of expertise to do full day programming. And we really haven't done like summer camp programming. So um, we'll be looking for help with that. I also want to put a little idea in about um, I think about perhaps the Teaching and Learning Institute at East High School, but working hopefully with high school students or students who might be thinking about careers related to careers in the museum, whether it's teachers who would want to um, work as guest hosts, you know, on school breaks and in the summer, it's a great, great job, or would like to um, have internships in the summer program or in Woodbury School. So those are my thoughts. Awesome. Next, Andrew. Uh, I will be brief. Uh, so my two main, my, my big vision for just kind of the world of play, uh, particularly in the work that we do is partnering with higher ed, uh, whether that's like local, many of our local colleges around here and you making sure that play is incentivized for people in education majors, people who are doing the community youth development degrees, things like that, just to understand that like not only play should be something that is being taught from the foundation level, not just as something that's added on later once, you, once you're at the job. And uh, kind of to a similar point that Deborah brought up, another one of my grand visions of what it would like to be changed is it paying community members and partners to be play advocates, paying high school students to be play advocates. I think we have so many resources out here in Rochester, but we really wanna make sure that we are valuing and incentivizing people's time. So that's just my large scale vision, just to make sure that if we wanna have play be important, pay people to do it. Very good. Rebecca? Um, so my vision really is for um, all grade levels in the Rochester City School District to look at play as an actual instructional strategy that should be used. Um, and that I'm hoping that as they start to learn more about the benefits of play, like academically, socially, emotionally, the benefits that come from that, even children's abilities to just problem solve um, and get along with one another. 
um, and all of the academic benefits, um, even like the science and the research of executive functioning of like how the brain works and processes information, all can happen through pet play. So really my vision is for the district to, to look at play as an instructional strategy and for teachers to really understand the benefits of play so that hopefully it will become more of a toolbox um, use in classrooms. Wonderful. And Ani? I'm hoping that you all can hear me better now. Um, so for G2, um, we aim to see a world where all children are given the opportunity to experience the social and emotional benefits of child-directed play. And in doing so, developing those meaningful relationships with trustworthy adults in their lives. And so we hope to continue to expand the organizations, schools, students, and families that we serve. Um, and in the coming months, we also aim to continue with our current schools in the that they will allow. Um, it's a partner with new community site in order to create additional sustainable programs. Um, currently, we're working with uh, Jewish Family Service, uh, which has a program over at Rochester Highlands. And majority of those students that reside within that complex attend our CSD. And we're really looking forward to be able to provide our programs and services um, especially as our capacity as an organization continues to grow. Wonderful. And I would just like to jump in and add uh, an answer on behalf of GRASA. Um, if you are familiar at all with our relationship with the Rochester Area Community Foundation, we are an initiative of theirs. And I have been sort of a program officer to oversee the youth sports um, legacy funds that we received from the Ralph C. Wilson Jr. Foundation. And I, uh, because I get to sit there and, and, and have a lot of um, influence to, 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 to speak out to people who are listening, um, I make sure that we remind them constantly that this community has prioritized play. Play is just as valuable as sports and recreation. It's simply another format. And we have made a commitment, and Ralph C. Wilson has backed us on this, that we are making um, play an important element of this funding as we move forward. Uh, and we're also going to add some coaches training as a requirement um, in the near future. Uh, and training in youth development. Right, you, you know the sport inside and out. Now let's learn to, to learn kids inside and out so that sports can still be fun. So that um, all of that work that, that happens during play is something kids embrace. And then me personally, uh, my, my vision and mission, and I've chosen to accept it, is that one day play becomes the most popular four letter word ever. <laughs> and with that, I'm gonna reach out and ask if there are any questions anybody would like to ask any of the members of our panel. Hi, it's Aria. I just wanted to lift up um, Heather's question. Heather popped into the chat. Is the Strong Museum still open for early intervention specialists to use? Are you open at all for like educators? That, yes, and thank you for reminding me to say that we're also a way that we support families is that we have been open since June 27th. Um, there are some safety protocols that you can see on our website. I also want you to know that early intervention specialists along with families can come for free, foster families can get free memberships. Uh, we have a lot of other programs by which families can come either for free or at very reduced admission, depending on their circumstances. So please um, check our website for updates about the hours, but we are open. I just want to add to that one thing I forgot to say. We're also open for youth groups. So you can book while we don't offer our school lessons delivered by a teacher. You may bring groups to the museum if you're able to do that and book um, and get the group rate for that. Okay. Any other last minute questions?
All right, well, if they pop into your head as we go along, put them in the chat. I'm sure we can circle back around. And uh, I wanna thank all of my panelists for doing such a great job, both tonight on this presentation, but also every day out there in the community, plugging away for our kiddos. Um, I just appreciate you all so much. And I, and I wanna take a second to lift up. Um, when Jen showed our jam boards at the beginning, there was a blue post-it that someone put up and I, I take it they are a Mandalorian fan because it said, this is the way of learning and way was all capitalized. So whoever my secret Mandalorian fan is, yes, it is the way and we will make the way be. So thank you for that. And I'm gonna turn things back over to Jen and Beatrice. Awesome, thank you so much to all of our panelists tonight. Um, we appreciate all of you. Thank you to Carla for facilitating everything. Um, before we move on, we didn't schedule like a fun brain break like last time and we should have, that was, that was, that was on all of us. But I do wanna take a moment. So we're gonna all stand up or stand up if you can and we're gonna get our, get our sillies out. So however that looks like for you, for me, it's gonna be like this. And I'm just gonna get my sillies out for a couple of seconds because we all can't sit for like a gabillion hours. <laughs> We're getting them out, just shake, shimmy, 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 shake, 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 whatever that looks like for you. Cause we've all been sitting, we've all been sitting and we need some time to move. So whatever that looks like, just take that second right now, stretch, move, be a little silly, right? Okay, so I'm going to, we're going to now do another poll everywhere. So, but before I do, I wanna share some definitions with you first. So we're gonna start talking a little bit about identifying our stakeholders of who we're trying to influence, who are our champions and who maybe, maybe, aren't really on board with this idea of play, right? So your definitions are champion. So we're gonna go through each of these things on the poll everywhere. There's a question for each. And a champion is someone who's an ally in this advocacy. It could be a parent, an elected official, others that you know who are supportive, folks who you think will be on board with us because you know, tonight we're 36 people, but there was 80 of us in all of these sessions. So who else beyond the 80 of us do we need to reach out to, to recruit to this? Then there's the distractors. They're the ones that need to be convinced, right? They're the ones that aren't on, maybe aren't on board. Maybe they're a little too worried about testing <laughs> and you know, all of that stuff. And I don't really know the benefits that play can bring to a child's learning experience. They could be people, they could be organizations. And it's not necessarily that it's bad. They just could have competing priorities than what we're saying, right? And they're just not on board yet and we have to convince them. Then you have your influencers. So an influencer can be a champion. They can be a distractor, it can be both but they are the ones that make the decisions. So they are the targets of whatever we plan on doing. So when we're doing those, thinking about our strategies and tactics today, they are the ones that we have to change their minds to take that action. So whether they can, they can change the system, they can change those policies, um, they are the people we wanna influence. So we're gonna spend some time on Poll Everywhere. So get out your phones or we will drop in the chat the link um, and I'm gonna stop sharing the PowerPoint and launch um, the first exercise while everybody does that. Beatrice just dropped the, the link in the chat while I set this up. And if Poll Everywhere doesn't work for you, y'all, we can you can just drop your ideas in the chat we are, we know technology sometimes is not awesome and doesn't work how it's supposed to. As is right now when I'm trying to open up this poll everywhere and can't seem to find it. 
such is the way if we're talking about the Mandalorian, right? Oh, people are starting going. I'm trying to share this and y'all are already sharing your ideas. All right, so who are those champions? Who, who, do, we, who do we got in here? You can vote for, for who you think. So if somebody's put something in already that, that you, you agree with, you can just uh, type it in there. If it, it is you know, active and engaged parents, yes, they are. RCSD hopefully is a champion, I would hope so. <laughs> kids, yeah, kids are getting a lot of votes right now. School leaders, administrators. Oh, more students. Early Learning Nation, Playworks, Marvelous Minds Academy. Yes, we have some amazing champion organizations who are doing incredible work. I love it. Teachers, our kids. I love how students and parents are number one, by the way, everybody. I love it. Oh. We got down here, scrolling down, some colleagues, sports teams, youth groups, me, me, me. I love whoever put that. Um, li librarians, teachers aides, school administration, business leaders, union leadership, all teachers, SUNY Geneseo, some specific organizations in here. And, and look at that, number eight. Eight, eight votes of active and engaged parents are our number one champions for this. Yes, y'all. I love it. Okay, do folks feel like you want to go to the next question or are you, you feeling good? Thumbs up? All right, I'm seeing some mostly thumbs up. So I'm going to go to the next question. So you're going to keep on the same, the same thing and this should show up for you in a second. Of, let's talk about distractors. Who are the folks that could sideline our efforts or who need to be convinced otherwise? You just refresh your screen. This should show, show up if you're on your internet. We see principals and funders and elected officials. Students and parents, again, we gotta convince some of them, right? Set-minded educators, old school educators, <laughs> folks who haven't been trained in a while. I love that. A lot of teachers, right? A lot of educators, the unions. Yeah, that's so true. A lot of teachers and administrators, right? politicians we see New York State Board of Education yeah oh my gosh you're all moving so fast I can't keep up we have politicians in general people who think they already know yeah it's sometimes hard to change people's minds right this is a this is a culture shift to what's going on you know we have school systems parents unions Number four, old, old, old school educators. I love how that is coming up as number one, right? Because it's often true, right? We often see a lot of younger teachers who are in the district now who are super supportive to this way of, of a playful learning environment. And unfortunately, due to union rules, sometimes they're, they're the ones let go first, right? And so they don't you know, have that same level of seniority as others who've been there for a long time. And I'm gonna say it, some people just know, need to know when they should retire, right? Because a cranky educator is no good for our kids. It's no good. If you don't love your job anymore, don't do it. All right, let's move to the last one. I, I seriously love y'all for putting that as the, the, top, the top distractor. <laughs> All right, final one. The influencers, who are the targets that we need to influence to push forward these changes? Who are the decision makers when it comes to playful learning? And you could be really specific. If you know a person that you're like, we should be in front of them, put their names down. 
So we have the community, politicians, policymakers. Ooh, a lot of funders. Board of Ed, definitely. The superintendent. Parents. Parents are influencers. Y'all are influencers. I hope you know that. Because politicians and stuff work for you. They work for all of us, not the other way around. Board of Ed, politicians, the community, kids. Some kids maybe need to be convinced. Deputy Superintendent of Teaching and Learning. I love how specific that is. Principals. It's good. I'm seeing, oh, deputies and chiefs, yeah. PTAs, definitely. We have a comment in the chat about, from Mary Louise about regents. They need to be convinced to this. I mean, the good thing is, is that Wade Norwood is a regent and he's also the CEO of Common Ground Health and letting and supporting us in this work. And we also now have um, Dr. Ruth Turner who is on the board of regents. Um, if you'll remember her, um, she is amazing and was leading all of the restorative practice in, um, in the district. And, is a champion for this stuff because she knows, right? She knows what it means to offer those playful learning and authentic experiences for kids. All right. Y'all can keep putting your ideas in that. Um, but what we're going to do now is we're going to take a 10 minute break. We're going to come back at 6.45 <laughs> then we're going to launch into our breakout rooms. And hopefully tonight you'll have a little bit more time in those rooms and um, we'll get you out a little bit before eight because we know it's a long day. So go take your break. We're gonna listen to some more disco funk um, and <laughs> go and enjoy and we'll meet you back here in a, in a few. Have a facilitator, you will also have um, some, you all decide who will be a note taker. And I'm going to actually post a link right now to the Google Forms um, for you all to click on. So whoever is the note taker can click on the link and put the notes in there. And so for this activity, we're going to be defining our strategies and our tactics um, and how we move forward and how do we get this work actually implemented. So this is going to get us closer into an actual action plan for future. And we put think big and I love that idea. Um, I used to have a mentor called Dr. Susan Salvador. Some of you may or may not know her, um, but she used to be the vice president at MCC. And she always used to say that everybody should put their ideas out there and the best ones will float to the top and the ones that we can actually do, we'll be able to bring them back down and implement them. So really think as big as you can think um, and then strategize. Is there an overall goal? Like, how do we communicate the importance of play? How do we educate individuals about the importance of play? Um, especially in the context of the previous activity that we just did with Poll Everywhere with your influencers and those who may be um, naysayers, if you will. And the tactic, we're going to dive into the nitty gritty of the how. Um, how do we do this? Do we create videos? Do we host webinars? Do we um, sign up to speak at, at public elected official meetings? It could be a whole variety of different tactics. And um, I just want to point out that we should think of all tactics, even if we think that there's something that should be a given, um, we want to make sure we're documenting it and writing it down. So is everybody clear on that? Thumbs up. Okay. All right. So Thea is our breakout session person again as well. So Thea. Before we before Thea brings us off, is there anybody that would like the ASL interpreters to go with them to their breakout room? Raise your hand, give an emoji. Anything? All right, we're good. Heather, they're coming with you to be be with Arwen and you, all right? Jen? Okay. Um, yeah. Have we decided how long we want them to be able to break out today? Yeah, yep. so we yes. give them for 40 minutes, Thea. Okay. So thank I you for that question. 
So and I'll send out a reminder or a 10 minute um, broadcast to everyone so you'll know when you can start wrapping up. Perfect, thank you. You're welcome. Is everybody ready? Oh, um, Sharon, hey. did you have a question? Yeah, I just wanted to remind the people who are recording to add all of the information to your Google form and don't hit send or done until the end of the discussion. Oh, good, thank you. Just thank for you. note takers to make it easier for you. <laughs> thank you for that feedback. All right, Thea is going to start um, moving us around and we should get a little pop-up window shortly. So I'll see some of you shortly. Everybody's moving. Miss Emma, did you get your breakout room assignment? It should have popped up on your screen. Miss Emma, you're muted. I can't hear you. Okay, now you can hear me. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Whatever room I want to join. It should have just popped up on your screen to join, join oh. a room. Oh, well, okay. Let me see. I, let me see if I can roll. Okay. She, she oh. got it. <laughs> Precious Namizi, are you there? You might still be on break. Um, Is everybody starting to come back? Yes, all the rooms have closed, Jen. Awesome. I just want to say thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Heather. You make my life so much better. I and this meeting's for me and Arwen much easier. Thank you. Awesome. Um, Beatrice, do you want to leave the next little bit? You want me to? It doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't matter. So why don't we? Why don't you share in the chat, or you know, take a minute to unmute yourself and share some of the takeaways from your discussion today. What do you, What did you all think we had to do? So Jen, I, I would share that. I mean, in our discussion, um, the importance of just the, the information and the and then and not knowing. So I, I think there's some concerns that are brought in reference to let's just say play and not having access to play within the building and the focus around academics and losing sight and removing, you know, what I feel and believe is the most important piece, which is the play. Um, was pretty strong within our conversation and, you know, the networking, holding each other accountable, you know, from parent to parent, from student to student, from teacher to teacher, um, but all being held accountable and, and advocating, advocating. I had a young man, Jazeera was in our group and he shared some experiences within his building. So I think even for myself, just informing the families and the community that recess is something that, you know, we look to have what should be taking place in all of our buildings at 20 minutes a day and it should not be taken away in any of our buildings uh, for any reason it should be it is part of the instructional program so i mean that was pretty strong within our conversation awesome our group talked about how play could be the idea of providing more professional development for teachers on play the idea of suggesting 10 minutes of playful learning within every content area, since teachers are given, a, you know, they need to have so many minutes for each piece. 
And then they talked about the idea of taking every quarter, taking um, a half a day or a day for all areas just to play so that they could be modeling the way we play in different content areas, the way we play in the library, the way we play in gym. So I thought that was a really neat idea. And we also talked about the importance of the administrative buy-in. Teachers mm -hmm. need to have that, feel that permission. Any other thoughts? Yeah, uh, our group actually had a really great discussion, really just about the purpose and culture of play overall. Uh, Don had a really amazing point you brought up that we kind of talk about how when we're looking at the role of play for kids, we kind of understand that, especially for little kids, that play is important. We need to have little kids play, but really once kids age out of that younger age, and especially when we're talking about adults, play is kind of stigmatized and that, you know, we don't see play as important. Yeah. But as she so expertly pointed out, everyone plays all the time. Everyone plays every day. And even if our, what play looks like to me isn't the same as what play looks like to you, we all find ways to utilize play. And in that same sense, that turns into the problem solving, relationship building, all these other skills that come about through the process of play. I love it. And as Mary Louise says, it's so important for administrators to get that and don't end up being punitive with educators who they think are playing too much in their classrooms, allowing their kids to play too much. What an absurd statement. Do any of the student leaders wanna share their thoughts from the discussion? No pressure. I'll, I'll say, okay, so Jayana and Makai were in our group and they spent a lot of time saying that we as organizations and educators and parents need to listen to students in what they want and need and shared we should be doing things like a student summit where students are are educating all of us on the importance of this and shared that we can't call it playful learning for kids because kids will check out when they hear the learning part. So making sure that the experience of play is there. And so we said one way we could do that is actually as organizations and and educators um, is to actually give resources to kids to help us create a campaign. So whether that's them doing the education material for educators, right? Or for um, their peers, that they are the ones that should be leading. Um, and they said that as much as they, I, I'm paraphrasing, as much as they love their parents, they don't really like listening to what their parents say, <laughs> that it means more coming from peers. And I think to add on to that is taking those voices, um, Alice, we were brought up a point that if we were to go to board meetings, parents and students are the ones they'd listen to. So we need to empower the kids and the parents to go to board meetings, to make the stand, to make sure it comes from the top down. I told you. I totally oh, agree because I say it all the time. I said it before, play is a child's work. So if you want them to be good at their job, they got to have practice. And they are the ones who know what works best for them. So you have to incorporate their voices. So I want to uplift that one of um, my students in, the, in my breakout room actually felt that um, their student voices, that students are vocal and attend a lot of um, forums and do give a lot of feedback, but that it's not often incorporated. Um, and there is no transparency as to how their voices are incorporated with actionable steps and evidence based. So I just want to uplift that because I, I do agree with that piece. Um, and so it, it kind of ties into yes, they're coming to board meetings or talking to adults in their school. But then if they themselves can't see how their feedback was actually um, taken and then applied, um, 
then they're starting, they, they feel like they're not being heard. And so I think adults need to figure out how to better do that for them. Yeah. I'm seeing a lot in the chat, um, you know, play is part of school and it helps children learn, you know, that long ago elementary school had an hour of recess every day and Aria, Carla, I've had that experience when I was in school in Canada and not here. Um, I had an hour every day um, and that 20 minutes isn't enough. Naziah is saying that, you know, lunch starts at 1230 and it's not fair to us because we feel rushed, right? Any other thought? Oh, there's one here from Heather. We need to empower parents. So let parents take the lead in this too. So we talked about students, but we also said parents have the power to make, to, to make influencers listen. And I, um, as I was in my group and, and I reiterated that recess is a policy in this district. So there are, there shouldn't be any exceptions to the rule. That's the first thing. And it shouldn't be um, this particular school, as you know, we discussed, is doing recess every day. So there, they should not be the exception, right? Because they're doing what the rule says. So, I mean, we really and truly, as always, we have policies that are supposed to be in place, but guess what? They are not implemented. So when are we really and truly gonna hold the district accountable for giving our children recess like they're all entitled to, and it's written down that that's what's supposed to happen. Let's honestly talk about the elephant in the room. And yeah, we, our, our kids and what we want us to do and as parents, are we gonna talk about it? But when are we gonna insist on the policies being implemented so we don't even have to have certain conversations because what we said and we know should be done is being done so every child in the district gets at least 20 minutes of recess toy and so what i'm going to say is that this summer if you any other parent any other student on this call wants to come with me and we will bang on the superintendent's door the deputy superintendent's doors and all board of education will do that together and say, here's the policy, why isn't it happening, right? Because I think we've all heard enough stories just in our three sessions together of recess being taken away, recess not happening, it not happening in every single school and that's not okay. So. What, what if we make that as one of our top action items for over the summer? Totally, Jen. I'm all in. Me and my kids are yep. in. All right. I'm, I'm, I'm holding you all to it. We're, we're talking about it here. I'm seeing the ends. We're going to do this this summer and we will, we will knock on, we'll knock down some doors. Because you're right. Enough's enough. Okay. Any final thoughts? I was going to say, Carlos, this is what we've been waiting for. We've been trying and pushing, and this is what we need, the energy to just be like, superintendent, fix this. This is enough. Look, look what's going on with school meals. The superintendent is listening right now and fixing school meals, let me tell you that much. So we can do the same with recess, and we can do the same with playful learning. Y'all hold the power in this, right? Okay. So I love that. I love getting everybody energized because that makes me energized. So I'm going to turn it over to Beatrice so we can wrap up together um, and get you out of here on time. All right. So next steps, we're asking for your action items. So share on social media one bright spot of playful learning um, using the hashtag PlayRocksRCSD or and tagging us at Healthy Kids. And I'm going to put both of them in the chat as well. Um, and then also share the parent and student surveys within your networks. We are still accepting surveys. We do want to capture as many voices from as many parents and students as possible. So even if you've already sent it out, 
maybe they haven't taken it, just if you can send it out through your email or even Facebook Messenger, I will say Snapchat, but it may disappear. So just <laughs> um, using a site that won't disappear, but just getting helping us spread the word. We do want, again, as many, many surveys as possible. Um, and I'm gonna throw it out there. If you have an event or networking event or an opportunity and you want some paper surveys, you actually can just reach out to me and I will print some and bring some to you. I figured we have we have them in English and in Spanish, and we have already been able to print and give some out to some folks to distribute. Um, and so you, if you're there, you're tabling somewhere, folks can fill them out. Once they fill them out, I will collect them back from you and then do the data entry. So you don't even have to do the data entry. Just give them out, collect them, and I'll come, I'll pick them up and drop them off wherever. Um, so everything in Rochester is like 15 to 20 minutes. That's my philosophy. So I do not mind traveling throughout the region. Um, Jen, can you go to the next one? Thank you. Next steps. We are getting ready to gear up our kitchen table conversations. So again, if you know anyone within your network or an organization or someone you think we should be talking to, please let Jen and myself know. Um, we are going to be meeting next week and then reaching out to the list of folks that we have now. And on our list right now, we have parents, students, organizations, um, groups that are uh, listed as well. So we do have some organizations that said, you know, I can get like seven parents from my organization that um, you definitely should talk to. So let us know and we will um, put them on our kitchen table talk list and reach out to them and schedule it at a time that's convenient for them. So there's enough people on our team. Toyin, I got you, I see your, you in the chat. I'll reach out to you separately. <laughs> um, but there is enough people on our team where we really can accommodate a lot of schedules. Um, so let us know. So next steps, we're gonna continue with the survey. We're gonna then analyze the results. I think right now we have the survey and the kitchen table, the survey to end by the end of July, but we do have the ability to extend that date. So it's a soft closing date. Let me just put it like that. Um, and the kitchen table conversations, um, we'll probably will continue those throughout the summer as again, we're gonna base it on individual schedules um, and try to get those done and then develop a draft plan um, and then getting feedback on that plan. So we'll collect everything from the last three sessions, everything that was discussed. We have the video recordings, we have the chat recordings, we have the notes from Google Notes, compiling all of that into a draft plan that will get sent out to you all for feedback. That'll be your opportunity to say, well, this information was not captured or hey, I said that and this is really what I meant in that. Can you please expand on that? Um, and we will take that feedback and make those edits and then we send it back all to you before we go public with it so that we can say, yes, this is a collective effort and we're all on the same page and we agree with this vision and plan. Um, and then the community launch and sometime in September with Dr. Brian Wright. Um, so we are still finalizing that date. We recognize that September is also the first two weeks are very chaotic with school starting. So we are doing our best to avoid those dates. We know littles are going back and um, it's just always chaotic the first two weeks of school returning. And this year kids are coming back full time five days a week. So we want to acknowledge that it may be a little bit hectic, but we do want to do it in September. And so we will um, probably field out some dates to folks and get some feedback on that as well. And with that, if there are any other questions before we wrap up. Okay. Well, I had an amazing poll ready to ask you what day of the week worked better. And of course, the internet is not my friend today and technology is not my we'll friend. Email so, it for you. <laughs> so we will email you a poll um, so that you can help us solidify a date of if we meet, if we host this community launch in September, if it's in an evening like we did this or a Saturday morning or Saturday afternoon, we'll figure that out. So look out for that. Look out for some our follow up items um, and we will organize this summer and go and speak to school board and the superintendent about recess. So thank you all. Thank you all. You're appreciated. 
appreciated so much by our team. Um, and before you go, I'm going to make you do your evaluation poll of a scale of one to 10, one being the worst, 10 being the best. How would you rate the meeting tonight? Um, and, you know, have a great, have a great summer. Enjoy the rest of like school year's almost done. It's time to chill out and relax and be with friends and family. Appreciate y'all. Have a good night. Good night. Night, Miss Emma. <laughs> good night, Bye, everyone. everybody. Good night, everyone. All right, Toyin, I got you. Okay, Shauna, uh, click the link for the survey. Hello? Yes. Okay, Shauna clicked the link for the survey and it did not take her. Oh. Um, is it because she already did the survey at a previous meeting? Or each, each time it's a new survey? Yeah, it should just be a one page, one page only. There's only one question, I believe. <clears throat> it should just show up on your Zoom. Is that the, sir? Sasha, are you talking about the evaluation, like on a scale oh, of one to ten? Evaluation, yep, for yeah. me. All right, thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, so I got 10 surveys to print and deliver. All right, am I, am I shutting this down? Yes, ma'am.